Okay, thank you everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar today on climate resilient sanitation. Uh, we're very excited to share the evidence and insights from the Climate Resilient Sanitation Coalition and are grateful to IWA for hosting the session. My name is Nat Painter and I'm a consultant supporting UNICEF sanitation and hygiene portfolio. Uh, most relevantly for this conversation, I'm also the co-coordinator co of the Climate Resilient Sanitation Coalition and I'll be emceeing this web webinar. Um, before we get to the content, I just want to take a few moments to quickly cover some of the house housekeeping uh, issues here. So first of all, uh, as you've seen, this webinar will be recorded and made available uh, on demand. Uh, so for those of you uh, who wish to share it, that would be a, an excellent way to do it. Uh, the speakers who you'll be hearing from uh, are responsible for securing the copyright for their material. Um, and then finally, all of the opinions, hypotheses, and conclusions uh, are the responsibility of the speakers uh, and do not necessarily reflect uh, IWA's opinion. Um, and then a bit of the management of the conversation. Um, unfortunately, the microphones are muted uh, and that's perhaps a victim of our success because we have such a large number of participants. So we cannot respond to a raise hand request, but instead please use the chat box uh, for general requests and, and interactive activities. And then please use the Q and A box to send questions to specific uh, panelists or, or speakers, and those will be answered either during the discussion or online uh, as appropriate. I also wanted to flag a few other uh, important IWA initiatives. Uh, one is the Inclusive Urban Sanitation Initiative, uh, which seeks to reshape the global urban sanitation agenda through a dedicated campaign of sanit action. Uh, and through this, they're engaging diverse stakeholders through two broad objectives around uh, the public sector approach to sanitation service outcomes and progress uh, a widely applicable framework supported by applicable guidance, act, excuse me, actionable guidance uh, to advance inclusive urban sanitation. Uh, and this is drawing on a diverse pool of advisory board and, uh, and task force members. Uh, as part of this, there'll be a number of publications um, being released through the IWA Special Issues Journal, uh, more information through the knowledge management platforms, uh, as well as a global consulta consultation to support the urban sanitation framework uh, and workshop sessions uh, at events. Um, so we have a terrific panel and a terrific number of speakers today. Uh, I won't run through all of them and their designations, but please uh, take a look at who we have uh, coming today. They really represent some of the uh, best thinking around climate resilient sanitation and how it intersects between the climate space and the sanitation space. Uh, so the agenda, we have quite a rich agenda. Um, I'm doing the opening at the moment, but from there we'll be going to Kate who will set the scene around uh, climate resilience sanitation. And then Jose who will discuss some of the evidence and action from the CRS coalition uh, before shifting to a moderated panel discussion led by Dan Daniel and featuring uh, Mira Meta, Amelia Wenger, Senu Latalo and Juliet Willits. Uh, and then after that, we'll have an opportunity for a Q and A with the audience before we get some closing remarks from Ann Thomas. Uh, before we get into that, I just wanna take a minute to uh, understand what people's uh, take is on the climate uh, crisis and the interrelationship with sanitation. So we have a poll here uh, and the question is, what is the greatest threat? Uh, is it the threat from the climate crisis to sanitation service delivery or the threat to the climate from poorly managed sanitation? Uh, so really trying to understand where people believe the main issue is that uh, is coming forward that we'll be addressing today in the um, in the conversation. So ask you to take a few minutes to respond to the poll before we get into the answers and uh, we'll be discussing it at greater length today uh, on the call. So perhaps we can wrap up the poll and maybe share the results and see where where people are people are deciding. And all right, so majority is saying the threat from the climate crisis to sanitation uh, is that maybe narrowly edging out the other option. And really it's an unfair question because it's a trick question and the threat is both. Uh, the climate crisis of course is damaging to sanitation service delivery from climate events, but poorly managed sanitation is also a significant greenhouse gas emitter, uh, particularly of methane emissions and is a threat to the global uh, climate crisis. 
So uh, thank you for weighing in on that. And let me pass it over to Kate Medlicott from WHO. Thank you, Nat. Yes, I'm Kate Medlicott. I'm the sanitation team lead at WHO. And I want to just kind of set the scene for you now um, in terms of what we're doing as a coalition and some of the issues around climate and sanitation. So uh, if we go back to, uh, you know, clearly we've been thinking about sanitation and climate for some time, but it really sort of hit home for me at least when we did the World Toilet Day campaign in 2020 on sanitation and climate and it really came this question, what does sanitation have to do with climate? So what we want to do to you today is really show you that it has a lot to do with climate and let me unpack that a little bit for you now. So there's kind of two main trends, not enough water or too much water. Starting with, with not enough water, then clearly you have a risk that people need to go further to collect water for flushing, poor flush toilets might not work so much anymore, return to open defecation, blockage of sewers or, or, or you know, low flow in rivers that means we can't kind of flush out waste as fast as it normally would. When we have too much water, and this, I think this is the, the larger risk of, of sea level rise and increased uh, flooding, is we have you know, much greater uh, overflows of, of combined sewers, we have difficulty emptying pit latrines, we have uh, tidal uh, water coming in and rising sea levels, potentially inundating wastewater treatment plants, um, and of course greater uh, of pollution of groundwater. And then uh, thirdly, of course, emissions that's already been raised. So there's the emissions from all stages of the sanitation chain and from both on-site and off-site technologies. And we'll, we'll come back to that. So all of this matters because, you know, sanitation is a human right and a public good, of course, but it has all of these knock-on effects to the health and well-being of people, of ecosystems, and overall societal resilience, the resilience of our cities, the resilience of our food and energy systems. So we'll go into that a bit now. But any of us working in sanitation know that investments in sanitation are so precious and small. So any loss of sanitation services to climate events is, is a big deal. And we want to make sure that those investments are resilient to these future threats or can bounce back quickly. And, you know, we see more and more displaced people around the world and, and we see that, you know, climate events or lack of sanitation services places an even greater stress on those communities and um, potential loss of services. When it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, this work is moving quite quickly and it seems that as much as 2 to 6% of nationally determined contributions in um, developing economies comes from sanitation and we've seen studies that show really high levels of emissions as much as 50% in a Kampala study so this has been something that is historically very underestimated. When it comes to human health and the health of freshwater ecosystems you know, we know these we need to have high levels of coverage of sanitation services to get those health and environmental impacts so when we even lose a small amount of service, we get exposure in drinking water and irrigation water and in recreational water. And we're seeing the impacts of that like right now with large and widespread and more deadly outbreaks of, of cholera, typical diarrheal disease, but also vector-borne diseases like dengue fever, which is, which is really um, expanding its, its range at the moment. And to the ecosystems, of course, we see you know, eutrophication of, of inland lakes, toxic cyanobacterial blooms, and, and fish kills. So there's, there's a lot of, of risks here. Moving forward to, to marine ecosystems, and I think Amelia will touch on this later, I think it's something we have neglected, the, the extent to which marine ecosystems are impacted by untreated wastewater and up to 88% of them are exposed to, to uh, untreated wastewater, but also what amazing uh, greenhouse gas sinks, mangroves and um, sea grasses are. You can see up to 5 or 35% higher sequestration than, um, than typical rainforests. So 
I think this sort of makes the case why we need to get together and really work on this collectively. And we've been doing that through the Climate Resilience Sanitation Coalition for a number of years now. So really trying to, to pull together the evidence base, launch a joint call to action, and really make the case for these kind of win-win solutions. They're not necessarily always trade-offs between these risks and benefits, but actually solutions that can, um, can work towards all of those outcomes at once. Um, so we have been sharing the, the call to action through through the last two COPs, COP27, COP28, and working towards um, uh, implementation in a number of countries as well as trying to expand financing through the um, through the GCF Annex, which you'll also hear about. So uh, you'll see the link here to the call to action, which provides lots of information about um, what these various targets can do, whether it's governments or development partners, donors, academia, the private sector and climate activists. So really thoughtful actions there, which I'd encourage you to, to follow that link and read. And then finally, just a little bit on who we are as a coalition and where we're working. You can see all of the, the logos there, including IWA, who's hosting this, this webinar and a really broad um, scope of work in all of these uh, low and middle income countries that you see here. So with that, I'm going to pass now to Jose from SWA, who's going to go a bit deeper into the global processes. So over to you, Jose. Thank you, Kate. I uh, hope that you can hear me well. My name is Kate, that is uh, for the first year in um, working in the Secretariat of the Sanitation and Waterfall Partnership, which is a partnership hosted in, in UNICEF, and I'm providing support on climate action. First of all, I want to congratulate both and, uh, Nat and Kate for excellent presentations, and I will take over now, going a little bit more in depth into um, this issue that we are discussing in the interface of uh, climate change and sanitation and to also showcase a little bit of the work that we are doing within the, the, uh, the Climate Resilient Sanitation Coalition. And certainly SWA, Sanitation and Water for All, is a proud partner of the, of the coalition, and, and we are working closely with, uh, with key partners such as UNICEF, WHO, uh, University of Technology Sydney, the World Bank, and all of those that uh, Kate has already presented before. So we are very uh, proud and happy to be able to support uh, this important initiative. So with that said, let me just move into uh, more content. And let me kick off uh, the presentation by emphasizing that reducing climate risk impacts to sanitation is place and context specific. And there is no single approach, unfortunately, for reducing risk um, that are that it's appropriate across all the settings. Because of that, uh, maybe uh, we are going to remain a little bit in, in a solution-oriented discussion right now with the next set of slides, bearing in mind that obviously uh, global initiatives and global advocacy needs to meet uh, the reality on the ground. But as I said, um, there is no silver magic bullet uh, that we can give you to solve uh, the, all the problems at the at the local level. In the screen, what you can see is the intergovernmental planner on climate change um, framework for climate risk. What you will see there is that risk in the center of the figure, uh, risk of climate related impacts results from the interaction of climate related hazards that you can see on the left, such as droughts and floods with the interaction with exposure and vulnerability of human and natural systems. It has already referred to the natural systems. As it can be in this figure, changes both on the climatic system on the left and on socioeconomic processes on the right side are central drivers of the different four risk components, the hazards, the vulnerability, and the exposure. So therefore, it should be clear that if we are aiming to reduce um, climate risk, we will need to be looking at interventions that either reduce the climate hazards on one hand, or reduce the exposure and the vulnerability on the other hand. This is easy to say, but 
what is it then in our hands to change? Well, uh, let's focus then on the right side, the socioeconomic processes, because through socioeconomic pathways, such as um, our own work towards sustainable development, but also adaptation to climate change, and through good, good governance, we can manage to reduce exposure and vulnerability. This is in our control, trying to reduce exposure and vulnerability to climate hazards, and therefore, we will be contributing to reducing risk. Something that is key is understanding who is exposed to climate hazards and what sanitation services are exposed to climate hazards, because understanding this who and what will be key components for us to manage and reduce the exposure. Um, similarly, reducing vulnerability is, uh, is, is key as well. So understanding what are the key vulnerability drivers um, is of essence uh, to start uh, reducing climate risk to sanitation. It is also through socioeconomic processes that we can reduce, as Nat was saying before, greenhouse gases emissions. And in this way, we are referring to mitigation to climate change. So as we all know, reducing greenhouse gases emissions has a positive impact on the climate and is directly helping us to reduce the impact on hazards, which is the left side of the, of the figure. So building on this idea of reducing exposure, vulnerability, and reducing uh, climate hazards, the figure that you can see now on the screen brings to the center within the red circle the populations living in areas highly exposed to climate change hazards. And those are billions of people that right now live in this red ellipse uh, in the center of the figure. So as you can see, this red ellipse overlaps on the left with the yellow one, uh, which um, brings to your attention the yellow uh, ellipse, the billions of people that currently are not having enough or sufficient access to sanitation services. And um, the red ellipse also overlaps to the right with uh, the blue ellipse, which brings to your attention those billions of people that currently already uh, have access to uh, sanitation services. Well, the issue comes in the overlaps, right? Because in the overlap mark as B, where the red and the yellow uh, ellipses overlap, we see that there are urgent efforts uh, needed by countries to map and identify and then prioritize the areas where populations coexist with this high exposure to climate hazards and at the same time, low access to sanitation. This is obviously of particular importance to the less developed countries, which by the way, are obviously uh, the ones uh, that are being uh, both uh, contributing less to the impacts of climate change and at the same time, uh, the one lagging behind in terms of access. So in the part of a figure that is marked with the A, um, you know, our efforts must go towards ensuring the progress towards the achievement of universal access to sanitation. But there, new systems, when new systems are planned, built, and operated, we need to keep in mind um, both the attention to build adaptation and resilience, and at the same time to try to reduce as much as possible greenhouse gases emissions. In the case of uh, the blue uh, L, uh, of the blue part of the figure, um, overlapping with the red one. Here, uh, we want to bring to your attention that we need to identify who are the, uh, what, what are the existing sanitation services that are highly exposed to the impacts of climate hazards because those need to be retrofitted and need to be upgraded. And beyond that, for all the existing sanitation services, there are multiple opportunities uh, for different forms of recycling of wastewater at different scales, but also there are huge and untapped opportunities to continue reducing greenhouse gases emissions. What I want to present now to you is a closer look uh, to this overlap of climate hazards and sanitation, because what we can see on the slide is how coincidentally, the populations with the least access to safely managed sanitation are actually uh, overlapping to a very good degree uh, with areas uh, where flood risk is actually increasing. So let me bring to your attention, let me see if this works. 
you see, we see this part of Africa where access to uh, sanitation is very low, corresponding well with increasing flood risk. Similarly, we see parts in Central Asia that also correspond well. So I, we want to emphasize the attention of this overlap between um, current access to sanitation and the uh, impacts of different climate hazards, in this case, uh, sun and uh, flood. So um, with, uh, now in the next set of the slides, uh, we wanted to bring to your attention how uh, climate resilient sanitation has become now a global priority. It's been recently, just at COP28 in November last year, in December actually, that uh, a new global resilience framework has been agreed and uh, it's putting uh, the climate resilient water supply and climate resilient sanitation at the forefront of the global adaptation uh, agenda. And this has been a result of uh, advocacy work uh, from, the, from the sector, and it's been uh, consolidated, as we say, in this new global resilience agenda. Uh, for you to get a little bit more familiar, this new global resilience agenda comes with seven thematic targets, as we said, uh, the first one is fully dedicated to uh, water and sanitation. And you will see that there is an explicit reference uh, to work uh, towards 2030, building climate resilient sanitation services. Now, um, there are other thematic areas that um, relate to food and agriculture, to health, the ecosystems, infrastructure and human settlements, poverty eradication, as well as cultural heritage. And as Kate has been mentioning in her presentation, we see that there are very close links to many of these thematic areas. Obviously, the link in between uh, climate resilient sanitation and health is obvious. The link with food and agriculture can come through um, wastewater treatment and um, recycling and re reducing um, treated with, uh, wastewater. The relation with the ecosystems was also mentioned by Kate as well as uh, obviously the, the new global target on infrastructure calls for ensuring basic and continuous essential services for all. Clearly sanitation is uh, within those essential services. Well, um, just to say that um, in, in terms of, uh, Kate has illustrated a little bit of the journey towards COP28, and we have started to discuss as well opportunities towards COP29 uh, and COP30. COP29 taking place by the end of this year and COP30 taking place in Brazil by the end of next year. So there is an ongoing work program that is tasked now to develop the indicators for the global targets that I have just presented. Um, so we need to bear in mind that if we want to uh, advance towards climate resilience sanitation, um, there is a work program now thinking of what could be the indicators that will help us measure uh, progress. There are other initiatives, important initiatives taking place as well. Um, there is going to be a revision of the National Adaptation Plan um, planning guidance. Um, and there obviously we're going to be uh, advocating for a fair and right inclusion of um, climate resilient sanitation as part of the new guidelines to be developed. And there is also an ongoing discussion on what it's called transformative adaptation. Um, so we, we also want to uh, build on the opportunities of working with climate resilience sanitation to contribute to larger community resilience and uh, transformative adaptation. Second, oops, come here. Um, to also bring to your attention that as we move forward and we work uh, with uh, climate resilience sanitation, first, uh, something that is very much needed is that we get into a kind, kind of a common understanding and a common agreement on what is it actually that constitutes a climate resilient sanitation system. Because at the moment we've seen different organizations like suggesting different benchmarks um, um, and ways of considering a sanitation uh, system being climate resilient. So within Sanitation and Water for All, we have put in place a wide consultation uh, that is trying to bring us all together around the, the elements that constitute both the climate resilient water supply as well as climate resilient sanitation system. Uh, here in the screen, you see some of the bullet points that have been uh, put forward as key elements that could consider, such as having a climate risk analysis, um, resilient management and service delivery models, 
considering environmental and social um, safeguards, etc. And then also to bring to your attention that WHO and UNICEF are, are currently um, developing a two-year work program, which is tasked to develop indicators for climate resilient water supply and sanitation as well. You see the different stages on the screen. Um, there will be uh, consultations taking place while this work program moves uh, from reviewing emergency frameworks into developing a long list and then a short list of uh, potential indicators as well as piloting them. Then in terms of uh, mitigation, we wanted to bring to your attention um, that there are huge opportunities for sanitation to further engage in global climate processes and negotiations. Um, after the adoption of the global resilience targets that we have just seen, there is also a work program um, that it's um, working uh, on the revision um, of, um, of the NDCs. Actually, uh, countries have been called to submit revised and more ambitious nationally determined contributions by February 2025. We see that this is a great opportunity for the sanitation stakeholders to step up and participate of uh, wide national consultations taking place. And then, you know, um, suggest that uh, sanitation is actually much better integrated into these national determined contributions. At the moment, the, the analysis that it was conducted in 2020, feeling the temperature on how sanitation is incorporated into existing nationally determined contributions, what you can see on the screen is that we have at the best a 5% representation if we bring together sanitation and wastewater references. This is very low. And again, we are making a call here for you to consider how to participate in national processes taking place to make sure that sanitation is integrated into um, the revision of nationally determined contributions. I will say that there is uh, ongoing work by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That is a work program uh, that is called Mitigation and Vision Work Program, uh, which is currently having a global dialogues. Indeed, today uh, is finishing um, a three days dialogue uh, that is focused on cities, building, and urban systems. From the Climate Resilient Sanitation Coalition, we have made submissions, formal submissions to the UNFCCC, and, um, highlighting the, the huge contributions and on top opportunities of working with sanitation to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. Also, the good news is that this year, the COP29 Azerbaijan uh, presidency is um, is um, starting a, an initiative on waste sector methane abatement for climate action, where waste in general and wastewater sanitation in particular are very well received. So we will be working closely with the COP29 presidency to build the case for sanitation. Lastly, my, uh, my final slides go in terms of climate finance and sanitation because here, we also see with concern how the existing gap uh, to, towards the achievement of, um, of the universal access to, um, to sanitation, uh, we see a huge uh, funding gap. But when it comes to the potential tapping of uh, climate financing, we also see with uh, big concern that currently sanitation is very poorly benefiting from uh, climate financing. Uh, as you can see on the figure, is a very small amount of climate finance uh, dedicated to uh, climate resilient sanitation. Um, there are opportunities. The COP28 uh, saw the approval of the loss and damage fund, so we need to be able to and ready to see how uh, this, um, this can be directed towards uh, sanitation. And there is a new uh, quantified global goal on, on climate financing, but it will be agreed at COP. 29 this year. This will be um, sending important signals to the world in terms of what is the commitment from developed countries towards uh, investing in climate financing uh, in developing countries. And just to build this bridge with uh, climate financing, just to let you know that the uh, Climate Resilience Sanitation Coalition is working right now on closely with the Green Climate Fund and we are trusting um, what is going to be an annex to the existing water security PCF um, guidelines. What you can see 
on the screen is a little bit the structure that we are drafting right now. There will be consultations taking place this year, and the aim is to launch this uh, annex um, at COP29. Yeah, so this is a little bit in a nutshell. Uh, the purpose of the Climate Resilience and Sanitation Coalition. We have made an emphasis to these slides on influencing climate policy. Let's remember as well that we need to influence at the same time sanitation policy. We need to bring climate uh, sanitation into climate policy, but we need to bring climate into sanitation policies and strategies as well. From our side, our priorities go into the um, development of the CTF Annex that we have uh, so to you uh, in the previous slides, to build the evidence base and to continue working on mainstreaming sanitation in key global uh, negotiation tracks around adaptation, mitigation, and finance. And obviously, uh, emphasis goes towards building capacity at national level as well. With this, I think I will pass it uh, back to you. Terrific. Thank you, Jose, and thank you, Kate, for those uh, great presentations that really highlight the role of sanitation and climate uh, and many of the activities that are underway. Uh, and back to the um, the objective of the Climate Resilience Sanitation Coalition. And uh, one of the points that Jose touched upon is here's a, a poll, another poll for you. Uh, does sanitation appear more often in national climate policies or does climate appear more often in sanitation policies? Uh, so please take a minute to uh, review those. You have one data point from it that Jose uh, presented. So you'll have to do your best guess around the second data point. Um, and I think this is really the, the critical first step uh, in developing a strong climate resilience sanitation um, approach is making sure that it appears both in the climate policies and in the sanitation policies. So if we could put up the results uh, from the poll uh, and see where people are landing. Okay, so does sanitation here more in climate policies, 26% people uh, are landing on that side, and 74% are saying, does climate appear more often in sanitation policies? Uh, and the, the poll is correct. Um, what we've seen from, and this is a little, uh, a little out of date, but we do have evidence from back in 2020, excuse me, 2022, uh, that shows that about 40% of countries uh, have climate in their urban sanitation policies and 42% of countries have climate reflected in their rural sanitation policies, as opposed to the 5% that have sanitation in their climate policies that Jose mentioned. So with this, um, with this wrapping up of that initial um, presentations around the climate resilient sanitation situation and some of the actions underway, uh, let me pass it over to Daniel, who will lead a uh, panel discussion. Uh, Daniel, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Nate. Um, I'm privileged to have the opportunity uh, to lead this um, panel discussion, and I hope everyone can uh, see me clearly. Uh, I, we're going to be having a panel discussion, and it is my pleasure right now to uh, present to you uh, four distinguished colleagues that are going to be um, answering some questions and giving us their insights uh, about some of the latest um, knowledge, evidence, um, what we know about climate resilient sanitation and how to push um, this forward in the sanitation sector, but also integrating sanitation into climate and climate uh, into sanitation. I would like to begin by introducing to you uh, Dr. Amelia Wenger. Uh, who is the Water Pro Pollution Program Lead at the Wildlife Conservation Society and also a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Queensland uh, in Australia. Her recent work focuses on how to integrate the fields of conservation and sanitation so as to promote a more holistic approach to environment and development challenges. Uh, interestingly, Amelia once thought that she would become a veterinarian, uh, but after one day cleaning up after animals, she decided that was no, not good enough. Um, but interestingly, now she finds herself working with another kind of cleanup, the sanitation related challenges. So you're most welcome, Amelia. 
Uh, and uh, next, we also have uh, Sanyu Lutalo, who is a senior water and sanitation specialist with the World Bank uh, Water Practice Group uh, that works globally on water issues. Uh, she has worked for over 20 years in infrastructure development, leading the design, implementation, and evaluation of projects uh, in the World Bank with operations in over 15 countries across Africa, Europe, and Asia. She's currently leading the World Bank's analytical work uh, on climate resilient sanitation and also supporting other global operations in the water and sanitation sector. You're most welcome, Sanyu. And I might also uh, mention she's a fellow countrywoman uh, coming from Uganda, the pearl of Africa. So you're most welcome, uh, Sanyu. Uh, and then we're joined by uh, Mira Meta, who is the Professor Emeritus and Head of the Center for Water and Sanitation at SEPT University. She's had over 45 years of experience in water, urban development, and infrastructure finance across Africa and Sub-Saharan uh, Af Af Sub -Saharan Africa and Asia. So we have quite a lot of uh, experience uh, uh, coming uh, to bear in this webinar today. And of course, she has contributed significantly to advancing climate resilient sanitation issues, working uh, with organizations such as UNICEF, the World Bank, Water Aid, among many others. Her extensive career in water and sanitation actually started from her architectural background. And now, uh, for many years, she's been working as a key player in the global sanitation discourse again, showing us that water and sanitation are some sort of a blueprint uh, to urban development uh, globally. Uh, and last but not least, we are joined by Juliet Willets, uh, who is Professor and Research Director at the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the U Tech University of Technology, Sydney, uh, also in Australia. Uh, where she leads applied research to improve development, policy, and practice, uh, but with a strong focus on climate resilient sanitation, mainly in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, in her work, she partners with various agencies to promote evidence-based development policy and programming, and she also co-leads the Climate Resilient Sanitation Coalition, which is collaborating with IWA to co-host and organize this webinar today. Uh, her work uh, has, of course, earned many awards nationally and internationally, not least the IWA Applied Research in Sanitation Award. Uh, so you're most welcome, Juliet, uh, to this panel. Um, so I have um, a few questions for each of you, and I, I think I would like to start with you, Amelia. Uh, because your work was uh, briefly referenced by Kate uh, in her presentation uh, earlier. What can you tell us about the linkage between um, climate resilience uh, for sanitation systems and marine and freshwater uh, ecosystems? Some people are wondering today, where are we talking? We are here to discuss sanitation and climate. So where are we talking about oceans? Where are we talking about lakes? What is the connection here? How can climate resilient sanitation systems contribute to the resilience of you know freshwater or marine ecosystems and how can resilient marine or freshwater ecosystems contribute to the resilience of sanitation systems please break it down for us thank you daniel um and yes thanks for thank you for having me on this panel uh i know the link between uh sanitation systems and marine ecosystems might not be the first thing that people think about um but actually, uh, there is quite a strong link between them. So when um, wastewater, and I mean both sewage, but also then waste from uh, decentralized systems like overflowing pit latrines or pit latrines and septic tanks that are leaching into water bodies, um, when they get into both freshwater and coastal environments, they carry with them the um, pollutants that they have with them, including nutrients and organic pollution, among other things. And these two pollution types who have the most evidence uh, can degrade these ecosystems. So uh, can, and it's one of the major causes of uh, seagrass decline. As Kate mentioned, 88% um, of seagrasses are vulnerable to or exposed to uh, wastewater pollution. And so when these ecosystems are degraded, not only does it lead to this, I guess, lost sequestration potential. Kate talked about the fact that these are incredibly good um, 
uh, ecosystems for carbon sequestration, much better than terrestrial forests. They're um, commonly referred to as blue carbon ecosystems. And they, uh, so not only when they are degraded, you actually lose the sequestration potential because you've lost the ecosystem. But unlike uh, terrestrial forests, uh, mangroves and seagrass and salt marsh store uh, all of their carbon underground in their soil and sediment. And as you start losing these ecosystems, this soil and sediment is exposed to air and it kicks off these um, biological and um, chemical processes that actually creates carbon emissions as well. Um, and so not only have we lost the ecosystems, but we're actually now exposing their stock of carbon to the um, air and water and leading to carbon emissions. And just to give you a sense of um, how, what kind of level of emissions we're talking about. So if you think about 88% of seagrass being exposed to wastewater pollution, um, they hold that 88% uh, holds conservatively 4.4 billion tons of carbon, um, which equates to nearly half of the worldwide emissions, annual worldwide emissions from burning fossil fuels. So a huge carbon stock that are in these ecosystems. Um, not only so there's, there's that carbon kind of mitigation impact, but um, we talked about you know flooding, storm surges, sea level rise. So coastal ecosystems are really good at buffering coastlines. They stop a huge amount of wave energy. So as you lose these systems, you create you know more uh, exposure to coastal sanitation systems to these impacts, and it creates this vicious cycle. So you know it is both really important for climate mitigation, but also climate adaptation. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm taking away what that I've not so much encountered in my work. I've not been using so much blue carbon, uh, okay. but also uh, one interesting number I take away from your intervention. There are 4.4 billion tons of carbon uh, sequestered in stocks by these marine uh, ecosystems. That's quite impressive. And just by and seagrass. So just by seagrass alone. Even, yeah, okay. it doesn't even include mangroves. Yeah, it's all right. Okay, okay, okay. Interesting. So that's a very important ecosystem service uh, that they are providing there. Uh, mm -hmm. And interesting, yeah, because you talked about, uh, well, uh, they're squistering, and I think that uh, contributes a lot to, yeah, keeping deposits. So I would like to uh, pivot to uh, Sanyu Lutaga from the World Bank. Um, we've had, um, yeah, uh, these particular seagrasses uh, sequestering 4.4 billion tons of carbon. Uh, so what is the World Bank doing in this area? What can you tell us about uh, uh, the particular analytical work that the bank is doing currently and what lessons are emerging from that work? Is there a key number that we can uh, keep in mind as a takeaway from here or any other insights that are emerging from that work? Happy to hear from you, Sanyu. Thank you, Daniel. And it's a pleasure to be here to discuss this uh, important topic with this distinguished panel and uh, colleagues and uh, uh, other uh, partners from the Climate Resilient Urban, from the Climate Resilient Coalition. So the World Bank is currently undertaking analytical work, complementing the ongoing work by other partners. Uh, we're trying to make a compelling evidence-based case for climate resilient urban sanitation and to propose policy recommendations that will facilitate the integration of climate resilience, adaptation and mitigation considerations into urban sanitation policy and programming among our client countries. And one of the pillars of this analytical work is the review of uh, several case studies from uh, different countries across uh, North and South America, Africa and Asia both low and middle income countries, but we're, as well as uh, high income countries. And we're trying to explore how cities are responding to climate res uh, related challenges in providing um, resilient, safely managed urban sanitation services. First of all, it's worth noting that, that many of the challenges facing climate resilient sanitation are similar to those you know, um, required to implement traditional sanitation approaches. So we see the same issues around significant funding gaps, fragmented government structure, governance structures, uh, difficulties in targeting low-income areas, data, lack of data to con contextualize interventions and so on. 
But the, the, the study also demonstrates that, that many cities are, are proactively confronting this challenge, both in high income countries as well as low and middle income countries. And I'll highlight a few emerging lessons on, on some of the drivers and enablers for action that we are seeing in these cities. So the first one is really, um, you know, resilient urban sanitation is essential for, for wider urban water resilience. And, and water scarcity is, is, is often an important driver for innovative climate resilient sanitation approaches. So we're seeing this um, you know, in cities, you know, ranging from you know, San Francisco in, in, in North America to Chennai in, in Asia, Singapore, we're looking, we're seeing you know, the same sort of trend in Cape Town, Paranasset in Brazil and others. So basically we're seeing that circular economy initiatives you know, have the potential to transform climate-induced vulnerabilities into strengths. And many cities are, you know, actively taking on this approach with, uh, you know, with, with, with promising results. Um, you know, secondly, we are also, you know, another sort of emerging lesson is, is the need to, you know, to adopt a, a one water approach that enables a system, systems thinking across, you know, uh, where water, wastewater, and energy services can be, you know, jointly considered. So basically, um, to enable the adoption of climate resilient approaches in urban contexts, uh, sanitation should be considered alongside the wider urban services, you know, such as water supply, solid waste management, and drainage. And again, we're seeing this approach being taken on by many of the, 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 the case studies that we're looking at in trying to address these challenges. So looking across, across sectors, we're seeing this in Cape Town, we're seeing this in, in, in Singapore and, and, and other, other, other countries um, across, across the, the world. You know, a third, uh, a third point is really um, the need to leverage existing initiatives, you know, such as the citywide inclusive sanitation, sanitation approach, um, as which which provides a, a you know a good sort of starting point for mainstreaming climate resilience into urban sanitation, um, a citywide inclusive sanitation approach basically ensures that everyone has access to safely managed sanitation um, by by promoting a menu of solutions you know just both technical and as well as non technical solutions, and shifting you know from a from a infrastructure first approach. To, to, to considering the enabling environment, considering behavior change, and looking at the broader citywide context. And, and so there is an opportunity and an imperative to consolidate um, the principles of citywide inclusive sanitation with climate resilience. So basically to expand the citywide inclusive um, sanitation objectives to capture adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. You know more more intentionally. So this is, I think, an, an imperative that we need to work towards, and that you know we are already seeing from the results that several of the cities are already doing this. Um, and this applies to both sewer and non sewer approaches. For example, we are seeing um, you know you know ranging from from places like Lusaka, where we have active management of on site uh, sanitation and because large management systems. We're seeing um, options such as container-based sanitation systems in places like Nairobi. We're seeing, um, you know, that, you know, the linkage between on-site systems and the, the and the sewer. So, for example, the diversion of septic sunk systems connecting those to sewer systems in in Miami Dade in the United States, where you know we are having uh, impacts of sea level rise, and so these are the, some of the the, the the responses that we're seeing. Um, and then it's also important that the, the true cost of, of inaction to climate change be quantified and communicated to policymakers and other stakeholders. Um, globally, we we don't there, there is currently no as we don't have a sort of a reliable assessment, and this is one of the the, the um, our, you know the work that we're doing. One of the things that we would like to do is to try to come up with an estimate of sort of the global cost of achieving. Um, climate resilient urban sanitation, and we're trying to develop a methodology um, to basically mm -hmm. you know, assess the, co the cost of a do nothing scenario. At, at individual city levels, we are seeing that they are using this approach. Uh, we've seen this in Ontario, we've seen this in San Francisco and, 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 and several others. So this 
looking at the sort of the true cost of inaction is also important. Um, and then the importance of cross-sectoral partnerships and the promotion of research and innovation are really going to be very important in this, or they are already actually very important drivers for you know, building the, the, the capacity and knowledge in this area. So I think these are you know some of the emerging lessons. I'll yeah. stop there. There are quite a few others, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Sanyu. You've taken us on a very interesting ride from Singapore all the way to Los Angeles and then to Ontario, Chennai, Lusaka, and the wonderful city under the sun of Nairobi as well, uh, sharing examples. Uh, I pick up one theme uh, that uh, seemed, you seem to highlight about the linkage between the resilience of sanitation systems and resilience at a wider urban level. And I guess this is something that uh, Professor Mira Mita definitely has a lot of experience in. So I would like to turn to you, Mira, if you could highlight for us an example of a project that has managed to integrate or link uh, these different aspects together. What uh, examples could you share maybe from your work in India about the successful integration of climate resilience into urban sanitation planning and other uh, urban issues? Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks to the team for asking me to speak. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. Sanyu said, it's good to be in the presence of the illustrated panel that is here uh, with very different experience, I think. That is the nice thing about the panel, that it's quite wide-ranging experience that we are really talking about. I'm going to actually talk of one project that we are doing in the state of Maharashtra, uh, which is a state, it's a western uh, coastal state in India with about 400 cities and I think the urban population itself is about 60 million. So it's a huge state that we are talking about. Uh, and I'm going to talk of this project that is we are doing currently in three cities, three not very large cities, three medium-sized cities by Indian standards at least. And we are trying to bring in aspects related to climate resilience in wash services. So a variety of things. So not only sanitation, and we feel that you cannot uh, isolate and do only deal only with sanitation. It's important to look at wash services as a whole. And in fact, at the local level, you also have to start looking at other aspects related to local financing and so on. So, but I'll get into some of that. Our approach really was to, when we were approached by one of the banks, HSBC Bank, for their CSR project, which is a, co a corporate social responsibility project, which is a requirement in India for corporates to provide funding uh, for such projects. So this is something that we have been working with cities in the state of Maharashtra, and we said that how do we look at climate resilient and climate inclusive wash services and how do you do that and to test that we have we have taken up three cities where we are actually providing and i'll briefly highlight the kind of uh, activities that we are doing the first as you can see uh, there is on energy transition and that was the focus of our work which was focus of our funder also and we took a variety of uh, measures for the energy transition work. One major thing that we've been trying to do is to look at the use of electrical electricity in functioning of water supply and sanitation related activities. And to what extent this can be uh, replaced by better sources of more green sources in a sense uh, by using solar energy. We are trying to do this in a way that it doesn't become like a, some, a project that we are funding through this activity, but it's really taken up through a public-private partnership model. And the local governments actually are taking the lead in implementing these activities in their cities. So that's one activity that we have really taken up. And so these PPPs for solar energy are being implemented in these cities. 
I think in one city that implementation actually has happened. What's very interesting is that because of shift to solar energy for uh, use in their wash systems, they are actually able to reduce their operation and maintenance costs on these services to a great extent. And this actually also helps in terms of building uh, the fiscal capacity of the local government to a great extent also. So, uh, what we are also trying to look at is uh, out of the three cities, two cities are completely dependent on on-site sanitation systems. And one city is partially dependent on on-site. So one of the major uh, work that we need to fo focus on is the use of the, the trucks that are used for desludging activities. So we are exploring the possibility of uh, the EV or electric-based uh, vehicle that can be used for desludging activities. And this is currently being explored with some uh, firms in India. And if that actually happens along with uh, solar type of EV charging systems, then it will become quite a major uh, activity in terms of transition, energy transition in the wash sector. What we also realize is that it is not enough to look at only the urban local government or the utility as it would be called largely in the African context, but to also look beyond in terms of the the residential sector, commercial, industrial, and to what extent wash services in these areas are also uh, very energy intensive in terms of use of electricity. In India, the uh, residential level solar uh, panels are being promoted to a great extent, and there is subsidies that are being given for this. And this is something that we want to now explore the possibility, and therefore, it will again start bringing down the uh, the need for uh, electrical energy to a great extent. So that's something that we are mm -hmm. also doing. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Um, maybe if you could just mention one last thing about the scaling up part, and then we, we move to Juliet because of time. Uh, thank okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just uh, the second part was on mitigation, where not much, but I think on use of uh, reuse, uh, use of wastewater, treated wastewater for development of green areas is something that's very, very important. And it's helping in terms of carbon sequestration, but also, and I'm sweating just now because Indian cities have become really hot. The temperatures have now touched 45 in the city where I am. Delhi, we heard is now 50 degrees today. So it's something that is extremely important and that uh, will will need to be looked at. Okay. So, there were other things related to it since uh, Daniel wants me to hurry up. Yes, Let me please. just say yep. that although we are working in three cities, the whole idea mm -hmm. of doing this kind of activity is not to limit it to one or two, mm -hmm. three cities as pilot cities only. We work also with the state government. When I say state government of Maharashtra, mm -hmm. it is 400 cities, 60 million population. So we are talking of big numbers. And they have a mm -hmm. Department of Environment and Climate Change. And we have a sort of uh, memorandum of understanding with them to take up these activities across many cities and even rural areas within the state of Maharashtra. So that's broadly mm -hmm. the kind of work that we are doing. We are mm -hmm. capturing some of this through our monitoring efforts also. We have a major okay. monitoring system on services, which looks at over 400 mm -hmm. cities, 800 cities in India. So that's something mm -hmm. that we, I think uh, my team is putting up uh, uh, mm -hmm. probably links to these resources and they can be looked at. So thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, uh, Mira. Um, this is quite an interesting uh, example that you've shared. And it was uh, good that you talked something about uh, monitoring. Uh, because that provides a segue into what I wanted to ask Juliet and also connecting Alia uh, with what Sanyu talked about uh, ongoing work to measure the true cost of inaction, but also to assess 
uh, at a more global level. So a question to you, Juliet, and this will be the last because we don't have more time uh, for the discussion here, but what do you see as the most um, uh, challenging aspects in monitoring uh, and evaluating uh, climate resilience in sanitation systems and of course the wider urban uh, systems in which they are integrated and how can these challenges be addressed? Sure, thanks Daniel and yeah great to see so many participants mm -hmm. interested in climate resilient sanitation in this session. Mm -hmm. um, so on monitoring uh, many challenges, um, I'll just highlight three. Um, the first is that when you monitor, you can't monitor everything. Yes, you don't have the resources mm. to do that. So you have to decide what to monitor. And making that decision is difficult if the evidence base is thin. And unfortunately, that's the case for many aspects of climate resilient sanitation, that we have ideas about what we think will make systems more resilient, but we don't always have robust evidence of that in practice. Um, to help us know which things we should monitor. And obviously that can be solved through more research, but I think it also can be solved by um, using common sense, uh, depending on the different type of climate hazard. For instance, if we're talking about floods, mm -hmm. then clearly systems that better seal the sanitation systems from the wider context and that um, potentially in some cases raise latrines, um, those are kind of obvious steps that can be taken and can then also be monitored. But many other aspects, um, we may need more time to build up the evidence base. The second reason um, that monitoring is challenging when it comes to climate resilient sanitation is that the definition of resilience is different for everyone. I think in, in the broader climate uh, space, we see a lot of contestation about what resilience is um, and different ideas about that. And we also see it in our own sector um, related to sanitation. And so for some people, it's about the bouncing back. We want to get back to, at least to preserve um, the existing ways of pro providing services. But as we heard from Sanyu and the examples from Mira, um, we're also trying to bounce forward. We're trying to use the opportunity to think differently and to configure sanitation services in new ways um, which is more about transformative adaptation. And that's not trying to retain the same system. It's trying to use the opportunity to do things differently and to bounce forward. Um, so that's another aspect to um, different definitions of resilience and different ideas about what we're trying to achieve. And my third point is um, around um, if we're one of the big questions is how do we evaluate the effectiveness of a given uh, resilience measure or an adaptation measure? Um, how, how do we know how, how far to climate proof um, certain pieces of infrastructure? Should we spend a lot of money when we're not 100% sure of what chance it will be that it will be exposed? Mm. Or should we uh, not spend quite so much money but have very mm. fast and robust um, ways to respond in a, in a quick way. So this question of um, how, to, how to judge effectiveness and what threshold do we think is okay? Yeah. Is it okay if hit the trains flood once a year for a certain number of days? Um, and what kind of threshold to do with the health impacts um, could, are we prepared mm -hmm. to tolerate? So Kate mentioned, for instance, about dengue, about cholera, um, what kind of thresholds do we want to set for ourselves if we're going to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of the adaptation measures we take? So those, are, yeah, a few challenges, um, more work to be done, uh, I think, on, on each of them, and that will put us in better stead to be able to monitor and evaluate this area. Thanks, mm -hmm. Daniel. This is very interesting. Uh, I would have liked to ask you, okay, now that you've pointed out the three challenges, what should we do about them? Uh, but we have only limited time. Maybe that can be taken up uh, in the next uh, session about questions, um, since we do have uh, to give opportunity for questions as well. So thank you very much, uh, my dear colleagues uh, on the panel. And I would like to hand over now uh, back to Nate uh, to take us through yeah, uh, audience questions as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you to the panel for these uh, terrific questions. Don't turn off your cameras yet. Uh, you're still still on the hot seat. 
Uh, we have been getting some terrific questions in through the uh, Q&A function uh, from the audience members. And I just ask that people continue to do that. And many thanks to the other um, speakers who have been answering many of those questions uh, live. Uh, and so I think that's been a, a great uh, process for taking care of some of those questions um, uh, up front before they go um, go too far down the, down the conversation. Um, so one question that has come up that I think would be very uh, interesting and somewhat, uh, I enjoy a little controversy in the uh, questioning. Uh, and it's from uh, Punita Naidu, uh, who is asking about why do we need to have a conversation about uh, sanitation as a greenhouse gas emitter versus sanitation uh, as vulnerable to um, climate change? Uh, under the argument that sanitation, and uh, Panetta, apologies if I misrepresent your question, but under the um, under the theory that sanitation is a relatively small greenhouse gas emitter relative to the other sectors uh, out there, uh, but of course it is a, a significant health benefit and damage to sanitation systems puts whole communities at risk. Um, so I'm not sure, I feel like all of you are well placed to answer this question. Um, so whoever wants to take it on first, who, whoever's fastest to the unmute button, uh, if you can uh, take that uh, question. Mira, I think you won. <laughs> no, no, I don't really have much, but I am i don't think it's an either or question to my mind. Uh, both are important. It is true that uh, compared to other sectors, sanitation contribution to GAG emissions may not be as high, but also that we don't really know properly, that we have not really assessed that properly. So we need to do that and understand what actually are. And then when you talk of sanitation, there are other aspects related to solid waste management, for example, and which certainly has a lot of implication. But to say that we should not be focusing on more adaptation related aspects for sanitation i think so it's to me it's not either or both are equally important to really focus on which is more important i don't know it's a bit like which of your children do you love the most you, you can't ask people to do that uh and does anyone else want to add on that and, and build from nero's uh response but I'll say a few words. Um, so I think um, for me, the reason why the emissions is important is um, that it, we, from the, the little research there is in uh, 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 the global south, we know that the emissions are quite um, underestimated. And that means that it's possibly a much bigger contributor um, to methane. And methane has a very high global warming potential, particularly in the, ne in the near term. So methane is something that should be on the agenda for all countries um, just now. And hence for our sector, since methane is one of the biggest contributors, um, it's where we should be looking. Um, but I would, yeah, I think for uh, thinking about resilience, thinking about adaptation, that's already happening now. It's not like climate change is in the future. Maybe five or 10 years ago, we were thinking, oh, it's something we have to prepare for in the future, but we're already seeing such intense rainfall events, flooding, et cetera, already sanitation systems are failing. And that's what then gives a, a real urgency of the need to address, um, I guess, different kinds of resilience measures in infrastructure, in planning, in the financing, in all aspects of, of sanitation. So back to you, Nat. Great, thank you, Julia. Um, another question that come. Oh, sorry, Sanyu, please go ahead. Yes, no, I I agree with that. That my fellow panelists. Just maybe one additional point is I think, um, you know, the, the impact of of climate induced hazards on 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 sanitation is 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 quite obvious. It's in your face when you have a disaster or whatever. But you know the 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 resilience sort of the mitigation aspect is not is something that there isn't enough that isn't spoken about enough and that many people aren't aware of. And so I think there is that need to really share knowledge on that more widely with people who are outside of the sector. When we're speaking to, to, to you know, people that are you know, well-versed with sanitation, this is something that's, that 
that's not new, but when we speak to ministries of finance, we speak to economists and so on, this is something that we really need to emphasize. So I think, you know, I agree both are important, but I think the, the one that's in your face is more obvious and hence the need for us to sort of focus on both as we, you know, we discuss this. You know, to bring all the, both both ideas into the to the global discourse on, on sanitation and climate. I'll I'll be honest. I was hoping to spark more conflict among the panelists, but you guys are all in agreement, so that's that's less drama than I expected. Um, Amelia, I wanted to come over to you, and this is a slightly different take on a question that came in uh, over the chat, uh, but it's around indicators. Uh, and as Jose had mentioned, there are indicator development underway for uh, sanitation, for climate resilient sanitation. And I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what do you think would be good indicators for climate resilient sanitation as relates to ecosystems? Do you, do you see this as something distinct or uh, something that would be captured under more routine uh, monitoring? Like in terms of how would you be able to judge a system as being climate resilient and but it's not affecting ecosystems. Yeah, yeah, correct. Like, what, what if you, you know, if it was your birthday, uh, and you got one indicator for your birthday for sanitation and ecosystems, uh, what would that be? Uh, nutrient load reduction into the environment for the layperson, such as myself. <laughs> uh, when, uh, how <laughs> much? How much nitrogen? Um, especially is going into the environment into water bodies and mm -hmm. where um yeah. because it's the where piece is also really important because obviously ecosystems vary spatially so yeah mm -hmm. can we change the amount of nitrogen that is going into water bodies and and are, are you seeing that in place uh anywhere so far we are seeing it in terms of a project that um we have with uh, Cenovation that's actually on the mm -hmm. on the um, call where we the indicator that we went with was a nutrient load reduction as opposed to trying to fiddle with uh, measuring things within an ecosystem which are it's complicated um, mm -hmm. and so convinced a conservation funder to invest in a sanitation project because of its impacts to the ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, went with, they were sort of finally happy with reduction of nutrients. Um, and so we are seeing that as a useful metric and easier to quantify potentially than um, other things. Yeah. Okay, great. And and I see uh, Brian flagged in the chat that nutrient load was suggested in 1917 uh, originally. So yes. maybe the time has come to yeah. put it forward more, more centrally. Uh, and then one last comment, because I know we're running short on time, but maybe Juliet, over to you, because I believe you're working on some of the indicator uh, process. Uh, and if you can share what you can uh, about that, I know it's early days. Yeah, yeah. So it is early days. Um, so what Nat is referring to is the work that Jose also mentioned that uh, WHO and UNICEF are um, leading a program of work uh, for two years that's focused on how at the global level should we monitor climate resilient water and sanitation? And that process has a few steps. Um, at the moment, we're undertaking a set of evidence reviews. Um, so our team is led by Barbara Evans at the University of Leeds. And those evidence reviews will look at the question I touched on earlier, which is which things do we know already? Which things are we still yet to know? And we might have ideas about, but we don't yet have evidence. And we will also be gathering from people the kinds of methods and, and measures that any of you in the audience are using. Um, and so please do um, have a look on the WHO website. You can find an email address. Um, there'll also be open calls for people to contribute uh, the work you're doing so that that can be uh, used to help form a very long list of possible indicators, which will then be prioritized for those that are most suitable for global monitoring. And that process will take place over the next um, one and a half years or so. So it won't be fast, but it will be good. And we'll get there um, with you know, very important indicators, I think, that will be needed. If we think um, post-SDGs, et cetera, climate resilience is going to need to be a real part of global uh, monitoring. Thanks, Nat.
Great, thank you. And, and thank you to all the, the panelists and, and Daniel, thank you for ably moderating the conversation. Uh, thanks to the audience for the questions. Uh, apologies that we only had time for a couple of them, uh, but I know many of them were answered directly in the chat. So um, you're now free to turn your cameras off, have your coffees and your, your waters to rehydrate. Um, but thanks everyone, uh, I really appreciate uh, the, the time. And now uh, with that, let me pass it over to Ann Thomas, who will give us some closing remarks. Okay, thanks so much, Nat. And it's really such a pleasure to, to be here and see the, the large audience has gathered and all the interest. Um, I just, every time that we have one of the events of the coalition, it's amazing to see how the group has evolved and, and where our understanding of the linkages between sanitation and climate have gotten to. When we started the coalition three years ago, we were just a handful of, of agencies and basically our objective was how do we increase the voice of the sanitation sector in the climate space and conversely, how do we get climate thinking into the sanitation space? A second objective was really to build capacity of governments. But I think when we think about that first objective of being able to articulate these interlinkages, I think we heard very clearly from a lot of our panelists today and, and initial speakers how we've made those linkages quite clear across mitigation and adaptation. And so I think that's something that um, has been a major accomplishment for the group. And I encourage you to look at the uh, new coalition website that was, I believe, put into the chat where we have all the key messages and a lot of great resources that can already start helping you make those, those linkages in your programming. A second objective was around the capacity of countries. And I think we heard a lot more about some really granular um, examples of, of work that countries are doing, that agencies are, are undertaking from the World Bank, uh, from the, the World Conservation Society, and how we're like making these uh, initiatives relevant. We also heard about how we're getting more uh, granular interventions into the climate dialogue leading up to COP29. I think a couple of really important things around the, the new global resilience targets and the fact that sanitation is linked to nearly all of them is a really important point because I think it, it underlines for us the importance of sanitation in catalyzing climate action across multiple sectors. And it's really a sector where we have solutions and we, we know how to move forward. So how do we drive that agenda to start using sanitation as, as, a, as a real um, driver of, of climate action? Um, finally, I think just a note to say that we're, we're really happy from a UNICEF perspective to be co-leading this, this coalition and the effort on the new annex that's coming out this year. I think it's going to be a great resource for countries, help to build capacity and hopefully link climate resources to, to action at the, at the country level. So, so please do stay tuned for that. I think it's really important um, also when we think about safeguarding our investments in sanitation, that, that climate uh, resilient sanitation and the work that we're all doing is, is supporting sustainability uh, in the long term. So on that note, I thank you all for uh, being with us today and um, look forward to continuing the conversation with you in future events. Back to you, Nat. Great, thank you, Anne, uh, for those words, for summing up so uh, ably the conversation that has gone on today. And I think what's really, you know, so amazing about it is there's so much work going on on this topic. It's it's really uh, ignited a lot of interest around sanitation broadly and climate resilient sanitation in particular. I uh, just wanted to flag a few forthcoming uh, IWA webinars uh, and events. Uh, one on new digital developments, or excuse me, new developments for digital water another on strengthening regulatory frameworks for water and sanitation resilience, uh, and a webinar on urban sanitation challenges. Uh, and if I could ask some of the IWA uh, colleagues to drop this link uh, into the chat so that people can access that uh, as well. Uh, additional ones are around the uh, 19th IWA uh, Leading Edge Conference on Water and Wastewater Technologies. Um, for in uh, that will happen uh, next month, uh, towards the end of next month, uh, as well as the World Water Congress uh, and exhibition in Toronto uh, towards the end of the summer. Uh, and then please, uh, please take the opportunity to join the IWA network of water professionals. Um, I think I'm not sure if this is true, but I think IWA might be the largest uh, network of water professionals. So 
uh, there's a tremendous amount of resources there uh, and a terrific network uh, to be tapped into um, to uh, basically at whatever stage in your career you are. Um, so thank you uh, everyone for spending some time with us today. I uh, really appreciate the engagement that the audience had uh, in, in, in asking questions, responding to questions, responding to answers, uh, and spending the time with us to talk about climate resilience sanitation. Uh, the conversation's not over yet, so please stay tuned for more updates on climate resilience sanitation. Uh, thank you and have a great day and a great evening wherever you are in the world. Bye now.